For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. If you would like to support the channel and become part of our Ancient History fan community, visit patreon.com slash worldofantiquity. Welcome to the World of Antiquity channel. I'm David Miano, and I'm answering voicemails. Let's give one a listen. Hello, David. This is Raphael from France. What is your take on the tools and processes that were involved to build the huge megalithic polygonal walls and blocks that we see in South America and around the world? Thank you very much. And thank you for your question. I actually received another voicemail that's very similar to that one. So let's play that one too, and then I'll answer both of them. Hello, Professor Miano. Greetings from Poland. I'd like to ask about polygonal walls, polygonal masonry, how they had been doing it, what technique they use for such precise results, and why around the globe, if they were not interconnected, and why they stopped to build this way. Thanks. And thank you, too. Boy, a lot of people seem to be interested in this one. For those who don't know, the term polygonal masonry is used to describe a masonry pattern that incorporates blocks with more than four sides. When looking at the facade of a wall, often the stones, or the majority of the stones, are in the form of irregular pentagons or hexagons. The corners are not cut in right angles, except maybe occasionally, or for corner blocks. Polygonal masonry generally incorporates natural stone, the blocks having arbitrary shapes, and then they're processed in a way that they become irregular polygons that are tightly adjacent to one another on the front side of the structure. A feature of the polygonal masonry is that it doesn't require mortar, and it possesses sufficient strength and stability to withstand moderate earthquakes. The stone blocks were not held in place by wedges or cramps or anything like that. The the statics and mechanical strength of the walls derived totally from the enormous mass and weight of the stones themselves. In the archaeological record, the polygonal structure has been documented throughout mainland Greece, with the oldest remains having been found in Attica, in the Peloponnese, and in Acarnania. This technique of building walls used to be considered an intermediate period between that of the Cyclopean walls of Mycenaean times and the squared ashlar walls. But now, it's realized that it developed around the same time as the squared ashlar walls, and it's just a constructional variation. In the Greek world, the classical polygonal method was commonly used in the building of city walls, ramparts, bases, basements, and the substructure of large-scale terracing. It was particularly popular during the 5th century BCE, though it continued to be adopted somewhat more sporadically during the following centuries. Although it was never the most common form of masonry in the ancient world, it was common enough that we still have the remains of many examples. Some polygonal masonry is crude, others refined, and there are many types. In some places the stones have straight sides and in other areas curved sides. The different characteristics of polygonal masonry have led researchers to create divisions between them, so they'll label things as polygonal work with straight edges, or coarse polygonal, or lesbian masonry. No, no. Lesbian masonry because it is centered on the island of Lesbos, okay? The basic feature of the lesbian work is that the edges and the joints of the blocks are cut in curvilinear shape. One excellent example of polygonal lesbian masonry, can be seen at the sacred site of Delphi on the mainland. The great Temenos, dating from the 6th century BCE, features a steep boundary wall. That's the uh, monumental entrance to the sanctuary. Polygonal lesbian masonry was most popular during the 6th century BCE, and probably first appeared maybe a century before that. By the 4th century BCE, it had almost completely fallen into disuse. Walls, you see, were one of the greatest expenses of a Greek polis. Lesbian masonry, in particular, must have been particularly time-consuming and expensive. It required skilled craftsmen with uh, special tools. 
They're, uh, you know, a bevel, an angle measuring tool with rigid arms is usually enough when joining stones with generally straight sides. But curved joints require the use of a flexible ruler. The significant work involved in dressing these polygonal stones and the considerable skill required of masons may have been the underlying reason for the gradual move towards the use of more regular blocks and the laying of continuous courses of masonry, which is a task that unskilled laborers could do. Polygonal masonry walls are found in Italy, too. They're built of large limestone blocks without the use of mortar and are found throughout the mountainous regions of central Italy. Usually, they're not freestanding, but they're used as terrace revetment walls and applied in a variety of contexts, including fortifications, road embankments, agricultural terraces, funerary monuments, cisterns, towers, and as podia for urban and rural buildings. What I've shown you so far are ancient examples of polygonal masonry. But I realize you really want to know about the fortress of Sacsayhuaman, which is at Cusco in Peru, the chief city of the Inca Empire in its heyday. The dismantling of the fortress started in 1537, only five years after the first Spaniards reached Cusco. Yes, the Spanish did get to see it in its full glory, though the outer wall was never quite finished. What we see there now is what's left of the fortress after it was used and abused as a quarry for many centuries. The reason I haven't talked about this site already is because it's not an ancient site. It was built largely in the 1400s, which would make it contemporary with the late medieval period in Europe. That's out of my time period. Now, yes, there are people who argue that the constructions at Sacsayhuaman are older and dated to prehistoric times, which is also out of my field of expertise. But I keep getting questions about it, so I figure it's time to give you an answer. Historical records credit the design of the fortress to four architects over a period of years. Hualpa, Remachi, Maracanchi, Acajuana, and Calacunchui. It was begun in the reign of the great Inca empire builder Pachacuti, or perhaps his son Thupa, in the mid-15th century CE. See these smaller stones filled in here between the large ones? You may sometimes see on the internet people arguing that the Inca could not have built this fortress, and they point to these stones as evidence. They say these smaller stones constitute Inca repair work, and therefore the larger stones must come from an earlier period. But by simply asking around, doing some reading, or looking at old photos, a proper researcher would realize that these smaller stones are modern repair work and not from Inca times. Ancient Architects noted this on his channel. This stonework we can see here is modern renovation work, laid hundreds of years after the Inca period, and this was done to tidy up the site. You can see it all along the walls of Sacsayhuaman. This is shown when you compare the 1930s image with the modern one side by side. You can clearly see where the walls have been built up recently with inferior stone, to stop soil creeping down the hill, to protect the site and make it safe for tourists. There are three staggered sawtooth walls at Sacsayhuaman. It appears as if the third and second walls were built first, and the first wall, which is built of bigger and rougher stones and designed slightly differently, was built last. It shows signs of being unfinished. Some of the masonry here is consistent with the well-known ancient methods of stone processing, and so doesn't require any special explanation. But I do want to address the larger stone blocks, some of them weighing several tons. I hear the heaviest, one of the cornerstones is about 120 tons. The quality of the curved interfaces is striking and they fit very close to each other almost without a gap. The fact that they are almost perfectly fit together has caused some researchers, mistakenly, to decide that the stones were formed or cast from a certain plastic mixture. And different types have been proposed. But why would the designers choose to produce an expensive plastic mixture when there is a lot of ready-to-use material around. Natural stones of arbitrary shape that would work great for polygonal masonry. And why would they use a plastic mixture to make such complex forms? That method would have worked better for making stone blocks of uniform size. 
So I'm not convinced by the geopolymer arguments. I will leave a link to a video that goes into this issue in more detail for you if you're interested into looking into it uh, below the video. Probably the foremost expert on Inca architecture and stone construction was Jean-Pierre Protzen, who died earlier this year. It would have been great to talk to him, though he has left us with numerous books and articles on the subject. Another person who has done quite a bit of research on the topic is the architect Vincent Lee. He's written books and articles on the methods used to make the polygonal masonry at Sacsayhuaman II. And he's appeared on the television program Nova to talk about his theories. He's still around. Guess what? I wanted to give you the best answer possible, so I contacted Vince Lee to ask him some pointed questions about the construction techniques here. Here's our conversation. I uh, talked to a lot of people who have ideas about Sacsay Huaman, and um, they think, oh, the Inca, they, could, they couldn't have built it. They didn't have the technology. You know, it must have come from some ancient lost civilization or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Just in, in general, what do you think about those sorts of theories? Well, I, 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 uh, I, would, I don't uh, buy into any of those extraordinary theories like that. The ancients were just as smart as we are. And for some for some respects, probably better at what they were doing than we would be trying to do the same thing today because they did it all the time. And so I'm sure they had all sorts of tricks and methods of dealing with big stones and so forth that we uh, that we've since lost and and uh, and have uh, haven't thought of you know haven't re reconsidered yet. So yeah. uh, that's all nonsense. They were they were just as smart as we are and with uh, focused intelligence. They did everything that we find in antiquity, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I agree with you. Um, okay, let's talk about the process. So first of all, the stones, what are they made out of and where did they come from? Well, the, the work at, at, at Saxo Woman specifically is what we're talking about, is that yes, right? Yes, right, yeah. Yeah, well, it's kind of, it's all called Yukai Blue Limestone. It's quite a hard limestone. Uh, and the hillsides up behind the monument, that is to say further north than the monument, are scattered with outcrops of exactly the same kind of stone. Um, and, and, and in fact, quite a bit of it, if you go far enough north, maybe uh, three or four kilometers north of the site. The chroniclers talk about all sorts of different sources for the stone, um, including some that were very far away and very unlikely, frankly, to have been used certainly for the big monoliths. Um, and it's often unclear whether they're talking about the big stones in the in the northern terraces specifically, or maybe just the stones worked in the monument itself, which included a great deal of work, uh, you know, up on top of the hill and on the other sides of the hill from the northern terraces. And it's clear that a lot of that stone came from Rumi Kolko, which was the big andesite quarry down the canyon below, uh, below uh, Cusco and so forth and other places as well. But I, I think it's very likely that most of the stone in the northern terraces came from the, the hillsides just north of the monument itself. And how far would that have been uh, away from where they brought the, the stones? Well, the, the uh, if you go... Oh, I mean, approximately, just, yeah. Yeah, if you look on Google Earth, within about three or four kilometers, you've got outcrops of exactly the same kind of stone all over the place. And even in a few places, there is some evidence that there might have been quarrying, although the area is now, of course, densely inhabited by farmers and so forth. So a lot of that early evidence has gone away. Ephraim Squire, who visited the site in the 1850s, however, uh, before all that uh, more recent development happened, went up there and looked around and he said there was evidence of quarrying everywhere up on that hillside. Oh, okay. Um, and then uh, what would you think was the process for uh, quarrying the stone? Like how did they, how did they uh, make the, the, the blocks in the quarry? Well, one of the interesting things about the Incas uh, as opposed to most other ancient um, civilizations that built a lot of stuff with stone, the Incas did hardly any what we would call actual quarrying. That is to say that the, the Andes were so scattered with boulders and so forth, talus slides and scree slides and, and you know, mountains that were falling apart 
eroding and so forth, that they had an almost unlimited supply of loose material. And almost all of their work was done by, uh, by simply picking stones off of mountainsides or out of the ground, digging them out of the ground and using them as opposed to actually chopping them out of bedrock the way the Egyptians, for example, routinely did uh, in their time. I see, okay. That, um, that also, by the way, in my opinion, uh, it gives you some uh, reason to, to, uh, to understand why they preferred polygonal stonework. Because in addition to the fact that they didn't quarry them and therefore weren't in a position to chop rectangular or rectilinear blocks out of, the, out of bedrock, not only did they not do that, but, but the stones that they did use came in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And the only tool they had for, and they were often very hard stone. You know, Machu Picchu is, uh, is white granite. Uh, Oyante Tambo is rhyolite. Uh, Saxa Woman is, is, uh, is uh, this limestone. Uh, Cusco is andesite. Those are all hard stones. And, and a bronze chisel, which the, which the Incas had, won't do you any good with those stones. You, you, you have to use a hammer stone, much like the Egyptians did on granite up at the, at the quarries at Aswan. And the hammer stones are found all over the place if you know where to look. So it's clear that they were just bashing away the unwanted material. And clearly the less bashing, the be better. And so if, if you had a funny place in the wall to fill, the thing to do is to look around until you find a stone about that size and shape and bash away the net material necessary to fit it into place. I see. Did, um, did they bring the, the, the stones kind of just very rough uh, to the site before they kind of finished them? Or how much work did they do at the quarry before they brought it? Well, I, I guess, you know, a lot of the, the answers to a lot of these questions, we really don't know. But it seems to me the obvious way to handle them would be to bash away as much unnecessary material as possible at the site where they're found so that you have less weight to move in order to get them from there to the job site. And of course, the, if you've ever been to Oyante Tambo, have you ever been there? I've never been there. Oh, oh you've got to go. Uh, I it want is, to. Oh, <laughs> it's a major Inca site that was abandoned under construction and the quarry is still there. And all of what they were doing in the quarry there is evident to anybody that knows what to look for. And, uh, and the quarry was a long ways from the job site. And you can see evidence all over the quarry of stones being roughly shaped before being transported to the job site. Oh, excellent, yeah. So um, then how would they have gotten them to the site? That's another uh, way in which the, the Incas were, uh, as far as we can see, uh, quite unlike other cultures that did so much work with stone. Um, the only evidence we have of a stone being moved by the Incas is a drawing in the book by Waman Poma de Ayala called A Letter to a King, in which he shows a picture of a stone being dragged directly on the ground by a bunch of guys with ropes tied around the stone. And their, their supervisor is standing on the stone with apparently hollering at them with some sort of a little whip in his hands. And, uh, and uh, the chroniclers say that the Incas tended to simply drag stones directly on the ground. Well, it, it sounds a little fanciful when you apply it to the stones the size of those at Saxawaman. However, my good friend and colleague uh, Jean-Pierre Protzen, another architect like us, who's done a lot of, did a lot of work on this. He's now passed away, but um, he did a lot of work on this. And he uh, closely examined the quarries at Oyante Tambo, including the stones that were abandoned in transport between the quarry and the ruin site at Oyante Tambo. And by the way, some of the stones at Oyante are the size of those at Saxawaman. So what he found would apply to stones of the size of Saxawaman. And what he found was <clears throat> that one side, one of the broad sides had typically been smoothed off in a vaguely convex shape. And the edges were often turned up, beveled up so as to not dig in. And, it, it, and he even found uh, it, when he rolled them onto the side so that he could examine, could examine this, this uh, 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 convex 
base, uh, he even discovered drag marks on the stone indicating which direction it had been pulled in. And this applies to stones as much as 80 tons. And so um, there's a famous one right alongside the road just outside the town of uh, Oyante Tambo. It just looks like a great big stone boat. And it was being dragged on the ground by a huge long column, presumably of, of, um, of pullers. There were no sleds involved. So just dragging it, huh? Unbelievable. And we've done, he and I have both done the mathematics on it. And, and it, uh, yeah, how many found, men would you need? Well, um, one, of the, one of the examples that I, that I just mentioned of stones uh, at that site being abandoned and route includes three that are on a direct line. <clears throat> the road that they were being dragged on is now gone because it's out in the middle of a uh, farm field. However, presumably, these three stones were being dragged one in front of the other along an old hall road. And so what I did is I went out there and I measured that all three stones uh, came up with a pretty good approximate, but pretty good weight for, <clears throat> weight for each one. And then uh, measured the size of the hall roads that we still find in the quarry and going up to the ruins. And they're all almost all about six meters wide. And so that gives you some idea how many columns of pullers you could have. And then if you measure the distance between. Go ahead. If you measure the distance between the second and the third stones in line and the first and the second stone in line, you get a feel for how many uh, ranks of people you could fit in that space. So you end up with a rectangle of space about six meters wide as long as the distance between the stones that you can fill with pullers. And that gives you some idea. Of course, you don't know exactly how far apart they were and how close together they were on the ropes. But if you give me each a meter, for example, to work in, you come up with a, a, a number of people. And if you uh, apply that to the weight of the stone and assume that it was being dragged directly on the ground, you come up with a, a coefficient of friction of about 0.5. And if you, if you apply those numbers, then you get you come up with a rule of thumb that if you take the stone and multiply its tonnage by ten, that's how many people it would take to pull it by I that see. method. Uh, why? Why Germany, didn't they? Uh, why didn't they? Uh, I mean, I, I think I re read somewhere it might have been you who said uh, you don't pull stones, you push them. Um, and uh, why wouldn't they just put them on logs or something and, and push them along that way? Well, they. Um, for one thing, the terrain is very hilly and, and you know, the, the quarry that I'm talking about is up on the side of a huge mountainside. It's just, and it's a giant talus field is what it is. It just boulders everywhere. And, um, and uh, it turns out that it takes a lot of time and effort to build a sufficient, a haul road sufficient to use rollers and that sort of thing. You know, ro rollers, I, I've worked with, I've done a lot of work with big rocks, you know, in the field, just playing with them and doing, testing out theories and stuff like that. Rollers are very difficult to work with. They have to be all these, the same uh, diameter. They all have to be perfectly straight. They have to be perfectly round. The road has to be perfectly flat. And all of these conditions are, are very difficult to, to meet in the field. Uh, even the Egyptians very seldom, I think, use rollers. They used them inside the tombs and inside the, the, the monuments where they could create a perfectly flat surface because they were rolling them around on paved surfaces and stuff. But once you get out in the field, it's very hard to make rollers work. They bunch up under the load. They go crooked. The load, if there's the slightest uh, angle off to the side, or not angle, but slope to one side or the other, the, the, the load immediately tries to turn that way and you're constantly fighting it and everything. So, so it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to create a good haul road. And if you're dragging stones for a long distance, it's almost more trouble than it's worth. And these guys apparently had enough workers and so forth to, they could avoid that problem by just dragging them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about what happens when they get to the job site. Um, now you, I read you came up with this idea of, of coping and scribing. Uh, could you explain a little bit about that? And if and is that still your view, uh, that that's how they did it? It is still my view, but it, it takes a little explanation. 
the first thing you would do is you would drag all these stones to a, a staging yard someplace near the work, uh, rather than try to show up one stone at a time because the guys in the quarry had no idea where that where a particular stone was going. And the guys at the job site uh, just had to take what came. And, and of course they were assembling a wall and they had a particular opening to fill. So what they needed was a, a large supply of stones in the storage yard to choose from. So obviously the stones didn't go directly from the, from the quarry uh, right to the job site. They went to a staging yard where they were organized in such a way that a foreman could pick the ones that they wanted for the spaces that they were currently working on at that moment. Um, so, so, but, but the fitting question that you asked really brings uh, into uh, focus um, three possible methods that, I've, that I can see. The first is trial and error, of course. And if you read the Spanish Chronicles of the period, that's the one they all favor. In fact, that's the one they describe as being used with small stones, relatively small stones. N none of the chroniclers talk about, <clears throat> except for one, talk about using stones the size of those at Saxo Woman. So um, they're really talking about the smaller stones that you see all over Cusco. These are stones we call one or two man stones. You can just pick them up. You know, they're heavy, but they're not that heavy. And it turns out that, uh, again, my friend J.P. Proxen did an experiment in the quarries down at Rumi Colca, down the river from uh, Cusco. It's an andesite quarry. And he showed that by pre-shaping the next stone to be on the, into, fitted into the wall, and then um, chopping away a surface, a seat for it to sit on, and then leaving the dust on the seat and setting that pre-finished upper stone in the dust very carefully, and then removing it, you can see a pattern in the dust that shows where the high points are. And so you get your hammer out, you chop away at those high points a little bit, and you do the same thing all over again, and you find fewer and fewer high points. And if you do that long enough, pretty soon you've got a perfect fit. So he did that with two blocks, roughly the size of a eight by eight by 16 concrete block. So uh, this was, these were stones easy to move and easy therefore to carefully pick up and carefully replace. Uh, what he didn't do, he didn't fit a, a bedding joint, which is the base of the stone and an adjacent rising stone at the same time, which if you study the ruins at Saxo-Oman carefully, you can see was what was being done all the time. The, the, the walls are, are festooned with L-shaped joints where it's clear that the upper stone was led into the one, the one ex, next to it and beneath it in one operation, one big L-shaped joint. And he didn't do that. But I think that by smearing mud on the rising face so that it wouldn't fall off, you know, uh, and then fit it, carefully putting the stone diagonally into the space, touching both the rising and the bedding face, you could do the same thing that he did. So, so he showed that, yes, indeed, there's a place to fit small stones of the kinds you see all over Cusco by trial and error, and it's not all that hard. And um, clearly that's what the chroniclers saw when they got there, because they, they hired the, what well, hired is, is not the right word, of course, they forced the Inca masonries to build more walls for them. A lot of the walls in Cusco were built after the arrival of the Spaniards, but by Inca builders. So they saw the Incas doing it and they knew how it was done. The yeah, problem I've, with the big ones, the I've, problem with the big stones is that, that we don't know of any easy way to carefully pick up and carefully replace a big stone that was available to the Incas. There are places to do that. To, there, there are ways to do that, to move them, move a big stone in and out of position, but almost all of them would dis disturb this pattern in the dust that we're, that's needed to figure out what to do next, you know, where the high points are. And, and I don't know of any method they had for moving, certainly even, even the stones of uh, Hatun Rumiok, for example, uh, right down in Cusco, but certainly the stones at Saxo, I don't think they had any method of doing that that didn't involve disturbing the pattern in the dust. And so it's very uh, unclear to me exactly how the Incas would have solved that part of that problem to use the same method 
on the big stones that they did on the small. I see. So, so if, uh, you are le you're 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 leaning away now of from the trial and error theory, uh, thinking that might yeah, not be the I, way they did it. I, I just don't see how that they had the ability to do that. It's a, it would also, of course, with a huge stone like those at Saxo Woman, be enormously time consuming and unbelievably oh, yeah. <laughs> tedious, yeah. time consuming, and probably dangerous. And so, you know. Um, if you try to imagine doing what I just described with a big stone, even using the methods they had available, you're talking <laughs> a gigantic project. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, okay, so uh, many people have, have suggested to me getting away from that problem by using templates of some sort, using some mock-up of the stone instead of the stone itself. And presumably the template is lighter weight, uh -huh. Easier to move, uh -huh. blah blah blah. You can you, you use the same method, but you're using something like a balsa wood stone rather than the stone itself. I see. The problem with that is you would have to to pre-finish the next stone to go in the wall. Then you would have to make a perfect negative impression of it somehow that's that's accurate to tolerances of a millimeter. Then from that negative impression, you'd have to make a perfect positive impression to tolerances of a millimeter. And that positive impression would be the object you would move to use templating to finish the stone. And it would have to be A, lightweight enough to be easily movable, B, stable enough to resist the shrinkage of dry weather, the expansion of wet weather, constant movement back and forth, God knows how many times yeah. by a rough construction crew what what materials and methods did they have to make such a, a template out of? I, I'm unaware of it. I, we would yeah. we'd have a hard time doing that today. So uh, if it's not trial and error, are, and it's not the template, then what else is there? Well, I I was uh, as you know I'm an architect and I practiced for a long time time up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I was trained back east at Princeton. But when I got up there, back in this was back in the early '60s. They were still building a lot of stuff out of logs, log cabins. And I watched the old log scribers put logs together. And I said, wait a minute, you know, these guys are scribing these logs together and they get, they get a perfect fit every time. No trial and error involved. They take a lumpy shaped log and they scribe it onto a lumpy shaped log down below and they roll it into place one time and it fits. And if it doesn't fit, all, fit, all the other guys give them, you know, hell about it. The, the, the boss fires him and hires a different scriber. <laughs> and so I said, well, that's exactly what the Incas were doing with big rocks. I wonder how that process could be uh, transferred to big rocks. And that's where the idea came from. And, and of course, scribing is, is a well-known uh, uh, technique. Uh, it's, it's even still used by people that aren't building log cabins. For example, if you have a stone wall in your house and you want to put a nice bookshelf or a cabinet next to it, what the carpenter will do is on that side of the wood construction, he'll leave a, a, a fairly wide board and then he will take that uh, construction, set it against the stone wall and he'll take an object very much like a draftsman's compass and it has a point on one end and a, and a pencil on the other and uh, except it will have a, a, a level on it so that it's always in the same orientation in space. And he'll just run that cap, that compass down the face of the rock. He'll run the pointed end down the face of the rock, keeping the level bubble centered. And the pencil will then draw precisely that pattern of the face of the rock on that widened board. And then he just takes his jigsaw and he cuts along that pencil line, <coughs> pencil line and slides the the construction against the wall and it fits perfectly. Well, what about, what, what if you're fitting, you know, something with, with uh, three, well, what would be three sides that they have to worry about? Um, yeah. So, well, if they did it with stone, how would that work? Yeah, let's start with the lower core, the lowest course. The first course at Saxo Woman, you've seen pictures and all the, yeah. the joints between the stones are typically kind of long, more or less straight vertical joints. And that's where the biggest stones are, by the way, typically, except at the corners. And that's another struct. That's a structural matter. They're, they're put at the corner because that's the weak point in a zigzag wall. And so they put the big stones there. But anyway, 
the lowest course at Stocksville Mon is these large stones fitting together on these more, more or less vertical straight joints. I'll, I'll call them I-shaped joints. And in that case, uh, that's the easiest way to imagine using my method on stones. If you take two of those stones and set them far enough apart where several guys can work between them, the first thing you've done, of course, is you pick two stones that are kind of the same shape, shape, same shape to start with, because again, you want to chop as little as possible in order to make the fit, right? Yeah. Okay. You set them next to each other so a couple of guys can work between. And then what you do is you start chopping away those faces so that a sim so simple stick exactly that is initially a slightly longer than the longest distance between the stones. And you chop, chop away at those two surfaces so that no matter where you put the stick, it exactly fits between the stones. Ah. Now, now the ends of the stick have to be the, 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 the stone at the ends of the stick have to be the, the two stones, the two pieces of the stone that are touching when you slide it together. So that tells you that the stick, just like the, the carpenter's compass with the bubble, has to be kept level and straight. It can't, you can't wobble around. It's got to have the same orientation and space at all mm -hmm. times. So, so you make it a fork stick and on the fork, you put a plumb bob that keeps it from going ah, up and down from end to end. So that's and how they did, did leveling before the modern level was invented. Exactly, huh? exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I found plumb bobs. I have one here in my, I found Inca plumb bobs. They had them all over the place. And, <clears throat> and you also have to keep it from rotating around the plumb line. And you do that by starting at the outer face of the stones, uh, uh, creating a, uh, cutting a, 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 uh, an edge joint on each stone and then carefully measuring in from that edge as you go back so that the distance back to each end of the stone is always exactly the same. And if you do those two things and you do this very, very carefully, you only have to start, move the stones one time. Oh, that's one time. right, yeah. And, they but, and it should fit, it should fit, right? Yeah. And then yeah. you just go side by side down the lower course like that. Right. Right, yeah. exactly. And, and, and the other thing to keep in mind with this method is it doesn't make any difference whether the surfaces are flat. In fact, the surfaces probably won't be flat. They'll, they'll have a certain warp to them that, that, that um, follows the original irregularity of the stones. Mm -hmm. you know? so, uh, but isn't so, it harder to do one on top? Because you yes. can't put the stone side by side. Right. That's, that's where you get into the, into the hard part. The scribing method is exactly the same. Although in that case, you have to scribe the rising joint and the bedding joint at the same time. You can't do one and then the other. And what that means is uh, you have to, instead of your scribe being in a horizontal position, your scribe is in a, a, a diagonal position, roughly at 45 degrees, so that you go down the rising face and just go right around the corner into the bedding face. Meantime, keeping keeping the same distance from the face and keeping the plumb bob straight. It'd be just like if it was a curved side, I guess, you know, or exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that's why if you look at those L-shaped joints, the corner at the bottom is always a round corner. It's never a square corner. You hardly ever see a square corner in, in uh, Inca work. In fact, uh, that's a whole other subject, but we, we can get into that later. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't you have to hold the rock up above the yeah, that's other the rock? So they, the what would you use for that? The rock has to be placed so that you can use the scribe in that orientation. And the way you would do that is you would suspend the stone, the next stone, even the big ones, above and to the off, and offset from the side of the rising face of the, of the seat that you're trying to create below. You would pre-shape pre the upper stone and then you would uh, prop it up in that position. And the way I showed it in my original paper, the one that you've read, of course, it looks pretty unstable and nobody wants to go under there and do anything, let alone chop away at any of the stones. And- um, So you came up with a better idea. Yeah, well, yeah, the better idea is that you, you have a retaining wall at the back of the, of the joint and the rear of the stone that you have suspended is supported on that retaining wall and only the front edge uh, the edge that will be exposed when the job is done and the, and, the, and the wall is backfilled. The front edge is what's propped up on the uh, log posts. 
And, and that's the other thing at Saxo Lawn. If you look at it carefully, you will see many of the stones have sort of, uh, uh, you know, computer sized uh, square or sl slightly rounded pockets along the lower face of the stone. Many of them just have a great big overhang on the lower face of the stone. And so all of those features were places where these, the tops of these posts could support the stone in this position. That this is my, this is my theory anyway. And um, people often say, oh, oh my God, those stones are too heavy. They, that couldn't possibly work. Not true. You know, you take a, an eight inch, 10 inch log on end, it will support thousands of pounds. I mean, you know, wood in that configuration where it's not being bent, it's just being compressed is a very strong material. Even, even softwood like lodgepole pine that we had up in Wyoming, um, you know, it's a thousand pounds per square inch. Well, you take a, you know, 10 inch thing, you're talking thousands of pounds, 50, 60,000 pounds of, of, of uh, supportive weight. And there are usually at least three or sometimes more of these posts underneath the front edge. Um, actually going through getting it there and look, putting the posts in place and then taking them away at the end and then finally lowering the stone. All of those things are tricky, but they're not, for people like the Incas that were clearly very good at messing with big rocks, they're, they're, they're not undoable at all. They're not difficult. They're just, you have to do it right. Very interesting. Yeah. that. Uh... That seems to be the most efficient way. Now, I guess they would get good at it enough where they could do it relatively quickly. I don't, I don't know. Um, but well, the uh, thing is, com compare the thing about it is that at least you're only moving the stones one or two times. You mm -hmm. you're not trying to move it, you know, thirty times or a hundred times or, or right, whatever. Because that, that's the hardest God knows part. how many times you know, yeah. have to move it to use to trial and error. Yeah, very interesting. Um, it's a it's a magnificent achievement uh, those walls and uh, um, yes yeah, it's it's, it's uh, the funny thing about it is it's so impressive that's why people uh, come up with all these strange theories about how the yeah. Inca couldn't have done it um, yeah. but uh, but really the, um, the I guess you would say that the, the the most difficult part would just be to figure out how to do it not to actually yeah. do it right yeah right. Yeah. yeah well. Um, it, it, these oh. guys, these guys were were wizards at messing with stones. You know, stone to the Incas was was a, a, a numinous material. I mean, it was it wasn't just a building material to them. That's why Inca stones masonry is not carved with all sorts of patterns in it typically, or you know, it's not used like other people did. The, the stone itself is the point, and that's why they just left them raw. You know. Mm -hmm. or, or with, the, with their, their, their faces, you know, and, and it's absolutely beautiful. Catch it in the right light and so forth. And, it, you know, they are totally unadorned stone walls, and yet they are absolutely gorgeous. When you get there, you look at them and you say, holy shit, did these guys have their, their shit together or what? You know, <laughs> it is. Yeah. And, you, and you'll, find, you'll also find stones. Uh, Pisac is a good example of this. Where where they're they're building these walls right on on cliffs, you know, that, that where the where the the face of the wall bleeds right into a three hundred foot cliff at the bottom, and then the first row of stones perfectly fit into that cliff, and the rest of the stones go. So they didn't even have one side of the wall to work in, and yet they managed to man they managed to do it. So these guys had serious stone <laughs> uh, working. Uh, techniques and, yeah. and uh, at their disposal. If you'd like to read any of Vince's material on Sacsayhuaman or other megalithic sites, you can find it on his website, www.vince-lee.com. Now, as for the question about whether there's some kind of cultural connection between the polygonal masonry work around the world, keep in mind that if correlating them means you have to divorce them from their historical contexts by ignoring their dates, the distinguishing differences between them, the surrounding features, the histories of the sites, it's more likely that they were developed independently, just as regular rectangular coarse masonry often was. The Inca architects of Sacsayhuaman ought to be lauded for their work. They created a masterpiece of design and technical achievement. 
the layout of the walls into the hillside and the leveling of the esplanade in front shows great sophistication and a respect for the landscape, too. They transformed it by preserving its features and integrating the man-made with the natural. And then there's the stonework, a stunning testimony to the organizational skills and the technical knowledge of the builders. The walls are monumental and imposing, but also subtle in detail and majestic in appearance. They're fantastic. The Inca clearly wanted to show what they knew and what they were capable of. If anyone else would like to leave me a question on my voicemail, you can do so at speakpipe.com slash David Miano. I can't guarantee that I'm going to answer every voicemail I get. It depends on how many I receive and what you ask me about. If it's a question about prehistoric times or about medieval times, I'm not as likely to answer it. This one was an exception. Ancient history questions are the best. And how interesting I think the general audience will find it is important too. Anyway, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.